edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. And I'm Annie Warmke. You certainly are. And today we're going to talk about sustainable cities, or it's not just for businesses anymore. So I don't know where you come <laughs> up with these yes, things. Yes, well, you know, and what I was thinking about when you brought up the idea of sustainable cities is the development of the city and the village and all of that was always centered around commerce. It was centered around industry. Sharing resources. It was a way of congregating workers together uh, for the benefit of business. And now what we're beginning to see is that people actually live in these cities. Yeah. Well, they weren't just congregating people to work. They were bringing people in for commerce. So you would bring your animals to the center to graze, and maybe you went to a shop and bought some salt or something like that. So um, there were real purposes. And I think one thing I'd like to think about as we talk about this today is not so much how this applies to large urban areas, um, even though that's what is defined lately as being more sustainable, as bringing more people into the cities. But what these concepts, what this thinking could do for smaller communities, small towns of say less than 60,000 or 40,000 people, or even 2,000 people, what could it mean economically and quality of life wise in these smaller communities? Because The larger communities are just going to get crazier and crazier. And like you like to say, the ideal sounds really good, but in practice, uh, it's not so great. So So what are you thinking about when you say a sustainable city versus just a city? All right. Well, so first of all, they like to say smart cities. So that goes along with... That's a bit of an oxymoron. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they like to say that. So where does it all begin? Well, it actually all begins with activism and people saying we want change. We want to be more efficient. We want life to be better. We want to change our focus on how we actually do things. And so according to the Global Environment Facility, it's estimated that more than 2 billion additional people will be living in cities by 2050. That's unbelievable. And so the need for sustainable infrastructure is more critical than it has ever been. And actually, it just seems impossible. I can't imagine so many of the people that would be coming to these cities have don't have as good a skill sets or any skill set. Many farmers, many people who've been migrant workers, you know, where does it all end? So in 1987, Brundtland Commission defined sustainability for cities as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So leave, pack, pack out what you pack in, right? Uh, leave, pretty much, leave pretty children. much, except mm-hmm. that you can't do that in big cities easily. It seems almost impossible. So so just to define sustainability a little bit more deeply, it really is made up of three pillars, economy, society, and the environment. Or they like to say these principles are also used as profit, people, and planet. So that these things are the formula that we build on when we want to make change in for the, for the future. A sustainable city then would be one that can meet its social, cultural, environmental, and political needs besides economic and physical objectives while making sure that there's an equitable access to services by residents without draining the city's resources. That in and of itself sounds impossible, but it is uh, a definition that was created in 1997. So the smart cities envisioned as a place where digital technologies, and again, we keep falling back on technology instead of the more organic processes that human beings have as they live together, work together, uh, have recreation together, transport each other. Right. Well, technology is one of the drivers that helps is helping create these cities. I mean, we see periodic trends where... People move into the city, it gets annoying, so they move out into the suburbs or whatever. But the the long-term trend is for people to pack themselves closely together. And of course, with 5G networks today that have such a short range but such high bandwidth, that's going to just drive people to be tighter and tighter clustered together. 
Well, the unfortunate thing, though, in that environment is it gives great corporate control over how we live and work and die and are born. And, you know, it's all kind of crazy. And I guess the other part of that is that it seems to me that human beings like to be packed in. So I don't know what's wrong with you and me. But uh, so when you go someplace like to the beach, you'll see everybody's, there might be a handful of people scattered and, and everybody else is packed in one spot. Or you, I, I don't know how many times we've stopped for a picnic somewhere. And all of a sudden, all these people are just rammed in together. And we're like, wait, wait, there's 84 tables over there. Choose one of those. We never say that. But it just seems human nature. We just choose. We, we vote with our feet. And, yes. And go out. But I will say that sometimes when people have visited us and, and we don't live that remotely uh, in terms of my thinking, but people from New York City and places like that have been really terrified and said, how can you live here? How can you live like this? You know, somebody could come and attack you. And I said, well, the odds of you getting attacked are much greater by the billion people that live down your street than by the people who come here. Plus I have a big dog. So it makes a difference. But anyway, so just to say there's really no universally accepted definition of what makes a city smart or green, but there are some kinds of ranking systems that include things like how the environmental impact, how, how that impacts each person. So things like renewable energy and the percentage of people using public transport and green spaces and different programs like recycling. And so that's that's how we have to begin to think. And really what happens is it's either going to be driven by activists or by corporate dollars that they see there's money to be made. And there is a lot of money to be made in smart and green living. So best practices of green cities include things like really good urban planning and as they say stricter codes yeah. so they want to again you know hammer okay, down well, we're doomed. drill down <laughs> drill down so they want well defined goals and regular reporting of progress so the bureaucracy will be live and well in sustainable cities well, we saw this when we lived in in europe you know in england they had the model of the city where you had a highly compacted downtown commercial area with with homes that were clustered in a circle around right. that that facilitated walking there was a transportation hub in the center and then surrounding the city was the green belt essentially open land that could not be developed and what that ended up doing is making the concentration of people in the city or the village much more concentrated but it kept the value of that property high because you couldn't just, you know, sprawl out in you know, along every highway like we seem to do here, where where you get all the strip malls and the tattoo parlors and the payday lenders, you know. So that comes down to planning. But do well, we have that will? It, it also comes down to city government that leads by example, and the examples that we have here are not sustainable. It's crazy. I mean, they build, they allow all these things to be built further and further out. So the highway just keeps going and then it dr drives everybody from the inner city where people can walk. So, well, and it's a model that's based on the automobile versus yes. in, in Europe, we saw a model that was based on public transport and walking. Well, there are different models too. I mean, like in, uh, in Belgium, everything is set up for you to have bicycles yeah, in Holland and, and you can areas. get run over very easily as an American because <laughs> you're not paying attention. And anyway, it was so great to see all these old ladies and riding their bikes with their groceries in the back, just pedaling along, you know, and sure. well, Holland has the advantage of not having a single hill in the entire. No, country. it's very flat. Yeah. I would be able to ride the bike there. So anyway, so, so who said here, here's a good one. Who said roadways are just for cars? So the idea is why not build roadways that are accessible to all travelers? So the Interloop East Transfer, sorry, Transformation Project in Rochester, New York, of all places where they have right. snow up to your eyeballs, did just that. The underused highway that they had uh, was transformed into a pedestrian paradise 
complete with energy efficient LED street lighting, a protected two-way bicycle lane. In this country, you'd have to have it protected because they would run over you or knock you down with their mirrors. Ample public seating. Who would ever think a highway and their seating? Safer crosswalks, wider side sidewalks, and really wonderful greenery. So thinking about something as having more than one purpose, this is the heart of sustainability. And we seem to lack this and we definitely don't teach it in, in school. So the other thing is that there's this um, thing called the Arctic. Let me look at my notes here because I don't know, uh, called the Arctic Project. Okay. And it's for the, for the Arctic. <laughs> uh, anything well, 60, melting, so I know, 60, 60 degrees, degrees north. north. Uh-huh. And so they 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 created some eight different ideas about what is sustainable and what they want to uh, promote as far as how they're going to develop. Well, who who is this? Because I'm thinking the Arctic region is fairly sparse. As well, far as there people. are some. There are lots of little towns. That's what I mean about little towns. Uh-huh. And there are some um, cities. I think Reykjavik is up there, uh, and. I'm not sure some cities in um, Iceland. Anyway, so they do exist. We just, they aren't hot spots for list learning to, uh, you know, how to go on vacation there. But so first of all, they talked about a complete walkable community and this was their bottom line. So they wanted to have mixed use facilities and mixed housing um, so that it met the needs of a variety of residents and various price, p- price points. So it was affordable and that the community was designed to protect the natural features. So sort of like what you're talking, this isn't a new concept. This is just saying, let's look at what has worked for people to live well together. So they have, they want to focus on low impact transportation systems that prioritize cycling and walking and also alternatives for single person automobile use. They want green buildings. So they're looking at LEED, which I don't, I'm not that keen about, but at least to say, how can well, we make things more sustainable? We should we should define what LEED is. Okay, tell us. Uh, You're the expert. Oh, I forget. It's an acronym, L-E-E-D, Leadership in Environmental and Ecological Design or something like that. And it's basically practices that architects use to make their, their buildings and their structures more environmentally conscious. So they talk about renewable energy and they talk about they like local smart sources buildings and, and yeah, mon- and they monitoring get, And they get different like bronze and gold and silver Platinum. for being, you know, extra whatever. And, but we can do these things without going after that kind of thing. It's good to have a good goal, but we don't have to Fa- fall under somebody's acronym to get this right. We so, have to have the will. To so much of to. this is about as you're saying, planning, because so many cities just kind of happen, right? They just kind of evolve. Well, because it's where the money develop. is. And so the politicians are often very motivated by the corporations and the businesses. And the business says, uh, you see this happen all the time. Well, my restaurant's over here, but it's not doing that great because if it was over there, it would get more customers, which is like practically within spitting distance. And they let them abandon the building and go to over there and build another restaurant. So this comes to the next one, flexible open spaces for both the community and the ecological needs. And that includes natural habitats for different reasons, recreation and space for growing food. So there would be a big push to have space, whether it's in a little tiny yard that you have or in a common space um, or a public space where food could be grown is a huge Thing. Well, and again, we saw that very often in Europe. I mean, the allotments in England. In fact, one of the roads, the road that we lived on in France was the Rue des Jardinets, you know, the street of the gardeners. It yes, was, and been there for hundreds of years. Yeah, and so everybody in the community just had their own little private garden. Well, and people grew food in pots on balconies and all kinds of things. All right, well, let me interrupt you there for just a second. And say that you are listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, reminding you once again, it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And thank God. And it's the end of the cities as we know it. And oh, I God. wish. Yes. So I guess what I want to talk about now is green infrastructure. 
And the idea that this is another place where we have to start and cities have not done with well with that. But I, I also wanted to back up for one second and say that when we talk about how things are done in the places we experienced when we lived in Europe, um, there are people, there are places in this country doing something similar, sure. but it isn't done as the government. It isn't done as looking at everything and saying, how can this work more efficiently? It seems to just have a snapshot of this uh, utility or this water or this um, block of houses. And what we have to do is to say, no, it's about everything. Well, and it's it's integrated into the culture in many places. What, and that's it, not, what is The it? whole idea of sustainable cities, the whole idea of livable cities is is just part of the culture as opposed to an experiment, which we see often here. It well, the just thing, has though, to be assumed. But in other places, they, they haven't just come to this. Sure. Yes, they are doing some of it, but this is gener intergenerational, where they had a green space in the middle of town, like I said, where you would bring your sheep to graze while you did other things. It's a common space. Sure. We, we don't think we should have common spaces. Well, and part of it is just population density. When you're living in a place like Western Europe, where the population density is pretty, pretty dense. You know, these folks have lived in these cities for a long, long time. They've had to learn how to make their cities sustainable. Here, we simply just say, oh, well, let's just push out. We got lots of land. Or build higher. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, it's not all great there. So I just want to say that as a disclaimer. But anyway, so we need to have green infrastructure that's around the management and supply of energy, water, and waste. And we need innovation. And we need financially viable heating and cooling options that are rooted in renewable. We need a healthy food system. And this is big because we're looking at this generation of kids coming up that will not live as long as we do in terms of their lifespan will be shorter. And it's because of the food or what I would call non-food, <laughs> fake food that they, they eat. And so also we need to preserve the culture, the social culture, the heritage cultures that we have and through food, through celebrations, through honoring of relationships. And this all centers around a healthy food system. Well, I wanted to back on the food thing. It's interesting because there's been a lot of talk in recent years about what the 50 mile meal and getting oh, like food 30 locally. miles and 10 yeah. miles, I think. But but it just brings up in my mind, you've, you've been on this quest every time we go into a grocery store and look at the fish to ask them, where is this fish from? I just did that because you were thinking about eating fish. But, but people, first off, the people in the store don't have a clue. No, they were totally, their eyes sort of started spinning like, why are you asking that? Yeah, and it turns out, I mean, in Podunk, Hillbilly, Southeastern Ohio, most of the fish seems to be coming from Ecuador. All of the Honduras fish, Chile, China, China, all know. the fish, even the fresh. Yeah. Think of that. It came all the way from... Why? Why are we getting catfish from China? I don't I go mean, down the hill and I catch know. yourself some <laughs> mighty big ones in the river. Yeah, that's just, that just is, oh, it just blows Yeah, mind. well, one thing that was interesting about that is I think it convinced you you're going to eat fish. Well, I keep thinking if they're bringing that all the way from China, uh, uh, what else are they bringing with it? You know, I mean, I'm not all that keen on that China's abiding by all of the health yeah. Oh, well, that's a given, but that's not what I think. It's my dad rearing up in my head going, what is the matter with the fish? And I said this to the manager of the one <laughs> store, what's wrong with the fish in this country? And I kept thinking, oh my God, I'm becoming too conservative, <laughs> but I just think it's local. And this is what I'm talking about. We have the ability to create these products and, and the onions, everybody is selling onions right now. And the onions in this podunk grocery store came from Peru yeah. in a bag. And I, I have to say to myself, globalization is destructive. And I, I'm not going to participate. I'd rather, I love onions. I, could, I eat onions every day, but I would go without them because I'm not going to buy them from Peru. Okay, so the food, and food is something that's quite, kind of, I think it's low-hanging fruit, sort yeah, of, well, it's, so to speak. I don't think it's that low-hanging, and I'll tell you why, because people don't know what to do with it. 
Yeah. They but want fast food. Locally. No, but they want fast food. They want easy food. And they don't know what to do to make food taste good because they're used to lots of salt and lots of processed sugar. So they don't know how to use herbs. Yeah. They don't understand cooking. Nobody learns to cook in school anymore that I'm aware of. You do sound like your dad. <laughs> in my day, people no, I, to sew their own dresses. Well, yes, that's true. <laughs> but this is the thing. Resiliency. Uh, yeah. What we're talking about when we list these things about and continuing with community facilities that support a healthy lifestyle, this is all resiliency. What we're saying is it's going to cost less for people to live. It's going to cost less for people to be healthy because they're not going to be as sick if they're living this way where they're included, where their mental health is good. Right now, there's a lot of suffering, uh, mental health suffering, because people are very isolated um, and culturally they're isolated. So the other thing is economic development has to include opportunities for business investment, employment, and a, and a range of commercial facilities. But again, all that has to come from planning and it has to come from a will that the government has to lead the way with this. Well, how does this impact it? Because I, I mean, it just occurred to me, so many people moved to cities to be close to work, and there were these commerce centers. In well, they moved cities. to cities because they're looking for work because they can't get work. Right, but that's where the employment is. Yes. But now in this world of, of remote working, they're moving to the cities because that's the only place where they can actually have the kind of bandwidth, the kind of internet that they can work remotely in, in a reasonable way. So then the whole purpose of these cities gets more towards how do I make this congregation of people more livable? You know, that seems to me to be a, a seismic shift in the way that we have to look at cities. No longer is it how do we facilitate people coming together so they can go to an office or an industrial park. It's how do we bring people together so that they can have a livable environment while they're working you know, some remotely and some providing services to the other folks who live there. Well, one thing that's happening that we're going to see a lot more of is that people are going to be in their community now. They're not going to be driving a long way to work. They're going to be working in that community. And so services are going to have to be there. Suburban areas are going to have to create little villages in the center of their suburban area. Um, but this all sounds positive. But as you say, it takes Well, planning. it takes planning. It takes the will. It takes people, it takes activism of saying we're going to stand up for what we believe and we're not going to put up with the stuff that doesn't work. Um, and we have to believe that people have the right to have a, a good way to live and that we measure those things versus only measuring how much money people make or have. So Portland, which is in the news a lot, uh, became a leader in sustainability. And um, they decided that one of their priorities was going to be good urban planning. They said it's absolutely vital. They said being located in an area of natural beauty um, helps people often feel more of a connection to their surroundings and their life and their mental health. And it's not just about saving the planet because going green drives revenue for a city and there's money to be made in sustainable manufacturing and services. And so that brings us to the whole point I've made several times already. And that is that cities becoming green, it's going to have to happen through small grassroots movements and that become viral, that become easily um, replicated. Because when you were talking you're really talking about middle-class people, but what happens to poor people, people who don't have skills, people who haven't had access to a re, a, a, an education, people who don't have the skills it takes to work in a city. Maybe they're farmers, maybe they were laborers learning their living with their bodies. Um, you know, we've when we talk about smart cities and all these things, we're really excluding those people. And they're very expensive people to the economy. And we seem to forget that or not want to realize well, I that. I think we're seeing that develop in sort of the two-tier economy of, as we're saying, the, the educated, remote um, working folks. But then there's an underlying service economy. Where those the gig people, economy. Yeah, the gig economy, the people who are working at the grocery stores, driving the Uber vehicles, 
dealing with the services that make a city run. And, and now what we have to do is, is value, value that appropriately. Well, that's a really good point because one of the things I think is activists and people who want change or believe that change is possible have to do is to begin to do a census of what is happening in their town or village or city that is sustainable, that is positive. And they've got to bring that to the forefront in signage, in marketing, in crying out at the city council or the um, village council meetings. But they have to start creating this sense of we are doing something sustainable and we're going to build from that versus just being the smart grid people or being sure. everything's about the money and the corporation. Well, that comes back to that when you started this discussion about three legs where you have an infrastructure leg where you're saying, okay, we're going to build a city that works in a sustainable way from an infrastructure point of view. We're going to build a city that works from an ecological stand- point of view, which means it's livable. You're not going to die from being choked out by the poisons or you have parkland to walk in, you have places to walk. But the third leg was the people. You know, it has to be sustainable so that the people who are servicing that city can make an adequate living to live in that city. Yeah. You know, it has. Well, to be and to have a quality of life, you know, sure. people deserve that. It's a it's an, a right, a moral right. Well, so here's one of the things that I, there were a lot of suggestions that I looked at. Yeah. But um, besides things like water bottle filling stations, these are such simple and expensive things or smartphone and tablet recharging stations that would be there for emergencies or people that, you know, are hiking or whatever. But this was called pop-up parks. So um, they created these pop-up parks in uh, called the Parking Project in San Francisco, where you just brought stuff into the into the parking lot, and you brought a pot and a chair, and you made it into a park for the day. And this became incredibly popular, and people started doing art on the pavement, and it became a whole tribal community thing just by saying, "For the day, it's going to be a park." Okay. So it cost nothing. It was fun. It made friends. People got to know each other. I mean, it doesn't cost a lot of money to do some of these things where we begin to grow the will of people to make change. All right. Well, with that, I want to let you know that you have been listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. We want to thank our sustainably award-winning producer, <laughs> Adam Rich, nominated for another Emmy. Way Whoa, to go, Adam. And yeah. uh, we want to thank you for spending just a little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother hopefully, probably, and possibly told you, the secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Play nice with others, clean up your own mess, and grow some vegetables. All right, sustainably in a pop-up park. Yeah. Until next time. Bye-bye. Mother Earth will sing and her children will be You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at blueroxstation.com.